what you are looking at here is text. Yep, text. Believe it or not, back in the 1980s and 90s, people found a way to make art from text. And they would share this art online, specifically on the electronic bulletin boards of the day. This episode of Back to the BBS talks about how art is made from text, the various art types, about what this art scene is like today, as well as what it was like in the past. This episode also meets some of the people and art groups and shows you how you can get involved too. In 1963, the X3, which was a part of the American Standards Association, which later became known as the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI, created the ASCII code. ASCII stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. It's a simple 7-bit code that is used to define plain text characters. It is this code that is used to this very day. When you press a letter, a number, or a symbol on your keyboard, ASCII is the code that translates that key press to the character you see on your screen or printer. It wasn't long after ASCII had been invented that creative types realized that if you use symbols like commas, dollar signs, and other characters, you could make a sort of crude art. People would print posters out on teletypes consisting of nothing but the 127 characters from ASCII. Yet, it would still look like a picture, especially if you squeezed your eyes up and tilted your head in the right way. In fact, ASCII art is still very much alive to this very day. As time went on, new standards that built on top of the ASCII code came into existence. In 1979, ANSI ratified one such code, a standard known as X3.64-1979, a 1-bit extension to the 7-bit ASCII code that allowed the use of things like bold text and a 16-colour palette. It provided cursor control, so that rather than seeing text appear from the top of the screen and fill it down to the bottom, it could relocate the cursor at any point on your text terminal. Finally, it has extra characters that allow you to do things like draw simple boxes, show smiley faces, and so on. Other codes were also made that weren't standards but were popular on their respective platforms. For example, Commodore made one called Petsky, which started life on the Commodore PET, but spanned the life of all of the popular 8-bit Commodore computers, including the Commodore 64. Atari had one called Atasky, and later systems such as the Commodore Amiga had a sleek-looking one called Topaz. In time, X3.64-1979 was simply referred to as ANSI. ANSI became somewhat ubiquitous over the course of the 1980s, given that the PC started to corner the small business and home computer user market by the end of the 80s. What the ANSI organisation could have never predicted is what happened next. A flourishing art scene made from text. And before that sounds ridiculous, have a look at these examples. I challenge you to say that these examples aren't cool and can also be considered art in their own kind. When BBSs first started out, the speed of dial-up modems were so slow. So slow that you could read the text coming on the screen at the same rate it was being sent to the screen from the modem. That was around 30 characters per second, or 300 baud. 
this was the common modem speed of the late 1970s and early 80s. So initially, because things were so slow, BBSs rarely used anything other than ASCII, otherwise commonly referred to as plain text. Fast forward a little into the mid-1980s and many BBSs were starting to flip to using the extra functionality of the ANSI character set or similar offerings like Petsky for Commodore systems. BBSs with a little bit of flair using colour and graphics, if you could call it that, were a big draw card and now that modems were a bit faster, it meant that there was sufficient bandwidth to send the extra few characters or bytes of data that the ANSI text mode required. In part one of the documentary, you've seen some examples of BBSs. All of those examples are what good examples of BBSs are. Part of what made them good examples is the art. In most cases, that means good ANSI. If a BBS had some of the best features and most entertaining message boards, it could be easy for the sysop to overlook the visual aspect. But in fact, when it comes to BBSs that don't have good visual appeal, many users often don't return to the BBS. A bit of colour and some killer ANSI art make the experience all that more memorable. Text mode graphics and BBSs are so inexorably intertwined, it would be impossible to imagine them without them. At first, the art that appeared on BBSs was relatively crude. Some were just simply boxes to contain menus or 2D stickmen type drawings. But people soon discovered that it was possible to draw more sophisticated art if you had a bit of patience. Soon people were using shading techniques to make their art show depth and detail. There was even animation possible with the cursor control sequences. Soon it became clear that the burgeoning scene needed a proper tool to draw ANSI art. The first one of note was known as ANSI Draw. However, it wasn't until the draw for MS-DOS appeared in January of 1986 that ANSI art really took off. The draw was very popular into the 1980s. On the back of the draw, the ANSI art team ACID made their own one called ACID Draw, which became notorious for BBS art seeners. In the modern day, Pablo Draw and Mobius are available for modern platforms such as Windows, Mac and Linux, and many artists still create art using these tools today. Many of them collaborate on works together or compete in competitions. Many artists submit their art into collective art packs, which can be seen on websites like 16 Colours. ANSI art became such a phenomenon during the 90s that BBSs started springing up all over the world with the sole purpose of only being an ANSI art BBS. Art teams such as ACID, ICE and CIA were formed. There were worldwide competitions to see who was producing the best artwork. The BBS operators, the artists and the organisers would colloquially be known as the ANSI scene, or sometimes simply the art scene. ANSI art is an aspect which is deserved of a documentary all on its own. Drawing good ANSI art is a labour of love. It would take at least hours, but often days or even months, to produce the most impressive artwork. Artists found that they could create art that would be longer than the usual 25 rows. When displayed, it would scroll down to the end of a drawing. Some of the longest drawings could be pages and pages long. If you were on a slow modem, that could take a pretty substantial time to download or view. These days, in most cases, some BBSs needed to have things artificially slow down the display of the ANSI artwork so you can see it as it was originally intended because the internet connection is so fast compared with the old dial-up. ANSI art was also great for snapshotting cyber culture, pop culture and issues occurring at the time. It is clear that nothing much has changed with this, even today. Most people involved in the ANSI art scene didn't get paid for their art. It was a competition. Which art team would beat the other art team? Every month, the teams would release art packs and send them to a headquarters BBS. Saying that these things were a labour of love was a huge understatement. 
most of the people that were involved in ANSI teams were juveniles and went on to become some of the most successful web designers, graphic designers or game developers of the modern age. My name is Rowan Lipkiewicz. Online, I have been better known as Cthulhu of Mr. Green and Acid. Uh, you mentioned that you had a number of affiliations um, uh, or affils, as they were often called back in the day. Um, so could you just list off what those affiliations were and uh, I guess perhaps introduce what those groups were or perhaps even still are? Absolutely. Back in the day, your reputation wouldn't necessarily precede you when you were hopping on to a new echo mail network message base on a new bulletin board you'd just been awarded access to. And so the people there might not necessarily be familiar with your handiwork, but if you were part of a sufficiently prestigious crew, you could uh, borrow some valor by f flaunting your affiliation and saying, hey guys, I'm Cthulhu, and they'd go, who the hell is Cthulhu? They'd say, well, you don't know me, but I am a member of Acid Incorporated. And they'd say, I know Acid, they do good work. So you're probably pretty elite. I'm gonna trust that Radman's done his homework. My involvement in Acid was not an outlier. Uh, it was known for very exciting ANSI artwork as the first crew to make a tradition of monthly art pack um, releases or acquisition updates as they like to call them. Uh, a tradition that never went beyond ACID. No one else called them that, but uh, all the art groups after ACID started doing art packs, lots of other groups emerged and they all started releasing art packs monthly too. But none of them hung in for as long as ACID um, without interruption, with the possible exception of ICE. It was a lot of young people and they had a variety of interests. Um, and if they failed to specialize in one particular discipline, they might have a lot of different affils uh, representing different activities they conducted. So I might say I'm Cthulhu and I'm a member of ACID, where I write the newsletters. And I'm a member of Mystery, where I release poetry. You can have your list of affiliations go on for the whole page, but uh, you know, it was it was better if you could just say who you were and people knew, because uh, you did good work in in large quantity that was well distributed, and you wouldn't need any fills after your name. My name is Willie Novak. I am known as Melfar Superstar. I'm an ANSI artist. Um, back in the old days of the scene, I did lit. I wrote for zines. I did a little bit of uh, ASCII art and the occasional Joe Gansies in Blender. And nowadays, I am mostly known for being the consigliere of Lazarus, uh, which is a scene group. So I did a lot of work recently in Fuel. So Fuel and Lazarus are what I'm kind of known for in the modern day. All these different names, Fuel and Acid and so forth, what, what are what, what are these? Are they, are they groups? First off, we're talking about a scene of artists. And the art does not, I'm trying to think about how to say this. The art gets released in something called a pack, which is a collection of art pieces. So the way, I mean, to use an analogy of the real world, it's like if a bunch of artists have a showing at a gallery and people come out to it. So you get these packs and the artists wouldn't just release randomly. They were members of groups and those groups released packs. And it was a competitive scene. Like everyone was trying to make their group better or make them the best. Like people took a lot of pride. There were feuds. One of the things I did when I was involved in, with Fuel is I tried to start, and this is recent. This is like in 2018, 2019. I really tried to start a feud between Fuel and another group. Um, just to like inject some of that old school drama back into the situation because there was a lot of drama back in the day. Um, but so the idea of these groups was these were collections. Usually it started with a series of friends. So the 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 the, 
the origin and the locus of the group was people who were friends with each other. Sometimes they would have the same vision, sometimes not. And then other artists would want to join. Maybe there there were sometimes like mentor-mentee relationships. Um, you know, sometimes, especially if a group got good, lots of people would want to be a part of that because it would give you, there was a lot of status for being a member of one of these groups. So that's sort of what a group is. You said the word zines. Can you tell me briefly yes. what a zine is? Well, I think, you know, a zine relative to the BBS scene is pretty much the same thing as a zine outside the BBS scene, except it's all a text file and they would get spread on BBSs and often, um, you know, that was just an area of, that was just a type of file that you could download is, it's someone has basically made an online magazine that is a text file that you can read. So the one I was a part of was called Radioactive Aardvark Dung. And it was all, it was obvious, it was very humorous. It was like silly, humorous articles. And I would definitely uh, discourage people from looking it up because if you find anything that I or they wrote, we're all getting canceled. It, it's okay. I expected all of this stuff to catch up to me one day. <laughs> My name is Ivan Segerich. My nickname is AVG and I am co-founder of Blocktronics. Um, so Blocktronics, tell all, what's, yeah. what's Blocktronics? Um, well, it's an anti group and we pretty much just draw anti. That's all we do. Yeah, we started in 2008. Um, probably around the time social media started to come up. At the time, you know, we used to communicate with IRC via IRC and it was kind of on the decline. Um, we found that it was impractical to just sit there and uh, wait for old anti artists to come back and, and try and engage um, with them and try and get them to start drawing anti again. So, um, you know, we, we decided to do something new around 2008-ish with Blocktronics. Um, and we came up with something like, I think it was Google Groups or something like that. This is like, this is almost like a, a forum of some, like a private message board. Um, and you could upload ANSIs and you could just like leave topics and, and things like that, but you would only invite people that you wanted on board. And I think that's how we started Blocktronics because we found that the traditional ways of just waiting on IRC and starting a group um, no longer worked um, because if you looked around, if you go on 16colors.net, you'll find around from about 2008, um, well, not from, but prior, but around 2008, the scene was almost dead. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't see packs come up very often. And if you did, there was nothing in them. Um, and it wasn't very inspiring or, or sort of motivating um, stuff. Oh, there would have been some good stuff, but there wasn't a lot of good stuff. Um, and I remember emailing the co-founder uh, Enzo, whose real name is Luciano, um, and he's a Brazilian artist. And, and I emailed him one day and I said, you know, we, we should probably do something because I'm quite bored. And uh, I think it'd be good if we, we get a new group going. We'd been in groups before together um, and we just brainstormed ideas. And then we tried finding a name and for some reason, I was stuck on everything with the word block. Block had to be in it. And Luciano Enzo, uh, in his head, the word Tronics just came to everything. So we'd throw words out and he'd say, Tronics, Tronics, Tronics. And we're like, no, 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 no. And I think we just threw so many names at each other that by the end of it, we got tired. And I think we just said, let's just put Block Tronics together. And we just kind of agreed on it because we were just, again, we were tired. And um, yeah, that's how the name came about, I suppose. Um, you said that you had you were in a situation of boredom. So I've kind of got two questions here. Yeah. Um, and you were doing, so you were doing ANSI before, but yeah. as you said, the scene kind of died away, um, mm. which, you know, there's a few people I think who would agree with that. But then, Blocktronics has now become one of the most influential ANSI groups of the modern day. Mm. Um, what what really, what made you think, you know what, there's this sort of, 
ANSI seen that, you know, had its day, the technology is outdated, the, the, you know, the people have moved on, they're doing vector graphics, all sorts of different types of graphics these days. Why did you and Enzo decide to get together and make this form of art come back to life again? Um, I think one, the most important thing was that we just gen we genuinely loved doing it. Um, you know, even when, you know, prior to, to Blocktronics, we were drawing just to draw. We didn't always draw for, for bulletin boards. Um, I know I rarely drawed for them. So uh, the first thing was that we just loved drawing ANSI. Um, and I think, yeah, that's been the, the, the main the main um, factor in all of it. Um, and, you know, there are a bunch of other factors that sort of, that came into play as well. Um, uh, I suppose, look, we had 2008, 2009, our first two packs came out. And then we had a break from 2009 to I think 2013, I think it was. Um, I remember we, we basically had a third pack ready to go in 2009 but it wasn't good enough. So 2013, Enzo messages me and says, hey, we're gonna release the third pack. And I'm like, okay, fair enough, let's go for it. Um, and around the same time, all these things are happening. I think I opened, I started a Facebook group, uh, an anti ASCII artist worldwide page. And as soon as I, I started this page, all these old guys from, from the scene like started joining and then they started inviting their old friends and so on. And so while that was happening, Blocktronics was releasing its third pack and we released it and we posted it in that Facebook group and it caught a lot of these old guys' attention. Like they, they went, oh, what, a new ANSI pack. So they downloaded it, they looked at it. And then I think after that pack, I think it was Awaken, that's what it was called. Um, after that pack, we had uh, a lot of these old guys coming back and just wanting to draw and wanting to join. Um, and it just happened. So I think the fact that we had that Facebook group and the third pack come out at the same time, I think that just helped everything to come together. And that's what helped, that's what helped get us to where we are today, I think. Um, we were able to accumulate a lot of old artists uh, in a single spot and keep them up to date with, with current events with Nancy. Um, and it, they would engage and, and it would get them interested. And to this day, it, it still works. <laughs> you know, I suppose thank you to everyone else that, that makes it happen. Um, we've had people, we've even had people like Radman draw for us. Now, um, that's a rare thing. That's like seeing a unicorn, I suppose, seeing Radman draw for you. We were, um, we we're quite taken back by that. But, you know, if we can get people like Radman draw for us, then. You know, why not keep it going? Uh, just for the, uh, the benefit of the viewer, Radman is the, the main fella behind um, Acid Productions back in the day, is that right? He's the, uh, yes, he's the godfather. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, he's, to me, he's the guy that sort of made it all happen. Um, I think he almost created that scene. You know, he worked very hard. I, I've had the pleasure of meeting him um, in 2016. I went to San Francisco and met up with him and uh, really, really good guy. Uh, heaps of respect for that bloke. The way he operated acid back in the day was um, almost equivalent to like a CEO would run a company. Um, obviously with no, with no profit, but um, I don't know how old he was when he started it, but let's just assume he was 14, 15. You know, for someone to do that at, at such a young age, I think it's quite remarkable. Now you guys in 2013, staying on that particular year, you did um, a phenomenal piece of work called Acid Trip in that year. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that was a good pack. Yeah. Want to tell me a little bit about the inspiration? Is there a particular story behind that one? Or... Okay. Uh, I think there was a few things. So the Acid Trip, I think that theme was set by the Creep Fever. Um, we would generally sort of throw theme ideas out. I think that keeps people interested um, and it, it keeps people fresh. Um, so you're not drawing the same thing over and over again. 
but um, I'm pretty sure Aaron, the Creep Fever, he came up with that theme and I think it it was a, a dedication to the um, Acid Art Group and Radman. Um, I think it was the first pack that we actually got um, Radman to coordinate, coordinate and release the pack, not release, but coordinate the pack. Um, and he did a really good job. And um, I think the motivation with, within the group was, was quite high. Uh, when all of that happened, um, we had the right people on board. Um, and I think we even did, no, did we do the larger scroll on that one? D no, that was a WTF four pack. Um, yeah, so Acid Trip was a, a dedication to Acid. I think we had Sons release in that pack as well, who's a, an old ANSI artist. Um, and what else do you, yeah, well, again, Radman himself in that pack. So Cat Bones also. Um, I remember a lot of good things coming from that pack. And, and again, it was packs like that, that pushed one, like it pushed us to sort of just go further with, with the medium. Um, you know, uh, someone like um, the Creep Fever would draw something phenomenal and it would make you want to draw something better. But you couldn't because it's TCF and he's a freak. But, uh, <laughs> but no, he's, he's, he's one of the greatest artists that you'll, um, you'll ever see. I, I, don't think, I don't think you'll find, in my top five, he's probably, he's probably number two. Um, but yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's definitely, a, a good guy too. I've, I've, again, I've met him. I've stayed at his place. I, I saw him last year in his hometown in Georgia. And yeah, real, real inspirational guy when it comes to you know pushing his medium. He's uh, he's a tattooist now, and he's a uh, yeah he's he's really talented. That guy. It makes uh, a lot of sense that uh, somebody in the ANSI art scene become a tattoo artist. I guess. Oh look. Um, um, <clears throat> The Creep Fever is a tattoo artist. Um, Cat Bones from Acid is a tattoo artist. Uh, Misfit, so James Misfit from, uh, from Blocktronics, he was a tattoo artist. I used to be a tattoo artist. I mean, I, I still do it part time. Um, I'd like to do it full time, but you know, obviously I can't. But yeah, it, it kind of it fits really well. Like even the fact that you've got you know your standard ANSI width is 80 columns and i find that the 80 columns that the proportion of how you draw an ansi the proportion of it uh, it kind of it's kind of the same with just say if you're designing a sleeve or something i think a lot of ansi artists could make a good transition to, to tattooing i think i've pushed it on a couple of other artists and that were quite hesitant but i honestly think that it would be a good career to pursue out of ansi yeah, I can definitely see that. And um, they're both they're both underground as well, like very underground. Like Ansi is like, you, you tell someone on the street what, what Ansi is, and they won't know what you're talking about. I mean, obviously a lot of people know what tattooing is, but it's still got a very underground following as well. Hmm. So yeah, I think um, for me, I don't know when I saw the acid trip um, particular piece, but it, I don't think it was in 2013 when it came out. But I saw it. Um, years ago and and i just thought well this is absolutely awesome and okay the, are, you, are you talking about the acid trips is was it an acid trip scroller that we'd done yes so it, it goes on for about i think seven minutes yeah um and uh, it, it's just so everything up until then and obviously i missed up personally i missed a whole bunch of ANSI art because um, my involvement in the BBS scene, it wasn't ANSI scene, it was BBS scene. I watched ANSI sort of mature, kind of got into about the sort of early-ish 90s, so 93, 94 kind of idea. And then, it, and then my BBSing experience kind of ended around 99, 2000. Okay. And, and what happens, I think, between then, obviously it kind of peaked, the ANSI scene kind of had a, a you know, tapered off um, not long after then. But I saw the quality of ANSI graphics going up and up and up, um, but really, really hit uh, something completely different um, when um, when ACID got involved. 
But even after the acid days, you know, when Blocktronics and, and similar groups got started, um, the, the quality of the ANSI graphics um, was was another level of professionalism. You know, I think maybe people grew up or, or something like that, but I just couldn't get over how amazing the, the, the work was and the dedication. Do you think there's any particular reason for that growth in quality and uh, maturity? Yeah, I think, I think one thing is, you know, coming from the old BBS scene that you did, a lot of a lot of the time, the ANSIs that you would get for your BBSs were were quite restricted, um, and the fa back then, the people that were drawing, which were they probably would have been in their teens back then, you know, uh, what was in at the time were just comic rips, um, you know of whoever, whether it be something from Marvel or, or DC or, you know, some some hot looking bikini girl. You know, they, these are things that were quite appealing to like a 15 year old, um, you know, and as we grow older, our interests sort of go in other avenues. And a lot of us in Blocktronics, I think all of us, we're all genuine artists. We, we love art. Um, I think to restrict yourself, um, in a medium that's already restrictive is is not very productive um, and i don't think it would be very motivating like how many times can you keep drawing the hulk or iron man i mean not say so that i haven't i've done them i think i've done them both actually um but um you look at other um other sources of in inspiration to uh create new art and you know you put that in an old medium and, and you can come up with some really good things um you know not only did we you know we stopped sort of restricting ourselves to 80 columns we started going to 160 and then you know 200s i think i've done like a, a 350 wide ANSI as well and um there, there was another guy that was in blocktronics i think he'd done like a, a 1400 wide logo it was insane but um, you know, I, I think we um, we just don't want to restrict ourselves to things. You know, it would just be pointless. Um, and then there are other things that we we do. Um, I think that we have themed packs. Uh, we also have things like you know, every year we come out with a calendar, so it pushes artists to do a lot of different things. It um, it challenges you to think differently about. Um, you know, what you're going to do. My name is Doug Moore. I go by Lord Scarlet online. The process of actually creating an ANSI, um, you know, for some people, especially the people who have never actually got down to the process of drawing an ANSI, what is that process actually like? Um, you know, what what tools do you use and, and what buttons do you press on your keyboard? How do you draw things? I mean, how do you actually get from these little, you know, blocks on your screen? How do you, how do you actually go about creating this art? There, there was a time when people manually put in the color codes and typed it, but pretty soon, starting with the draw, there were editors to do a lot of the hard work for you, or at least the tedious part. So the commands have largely stayed the same since the draw. You map a set of 10 of the characters to the function keys, and you have a way to swap between them. Typically, it's going to be the, the block char characters, starting with F1, 2, 3, and 4, are the solid block and the shaded blocks. And you, you would use the arrow keys to move around the screen, and you would your fingers would live on those function keys. You'd learn pretty quickly by heart what most of them are, but you're navigating around, you're hitting those keys, and it's it's just placing the character down just like you're typing. And once you get good at it, you can start to use those to to shape different different objects, almost like Lego. You know, Lego are square blocks. But if you stack them in the right way, you start to see curves, you start to see shapes, 
if you use negative space the right way, you can start to see other shapes within it. And then the foreground and background colors are really what start to play with and get interesting art out of it. So the way you place those shaded blocks next to each other, whether you use, you know, what early on the instinct is to use black to shade. You have red and different amounts of black showing through, but if you learn to use other colors to mix your shading, you learn not to um, not to put, you know, F1, 2, 3, 4, which would be your different levels of shade. You need to mix them up a little bit because it's almost like when you're drawing and you use lines to shade and you cross hatch instead of filling in with black, you need to create some depth by, by not making everything look linear and mechanical. Um, and you'll look, you'll see some artists like, um, Avenging Angel really play with those colors and they're completely wild um, color choices that are not true to life but create a level of depth that you know makes a great piece of art but the mechanical part of, of it is really using the keyboard using the arrow keys using the function keys to lay down text by text by text modern editors um and if anybody wants to get started pablo draw and mobius are both great editors they they have introduced a number of good great functions one is mouse drawing mouse selecting copy and paste mirroring objects so if you get half of a face drawn well you can mirror it so it's symmetrical and then then play with it to to make it um, look more realistic and not just mirrored the other huge change is multi-user editing so you can get into a drawing session with one or more people just like you would with say google docs and you can draw together and i think that has advanced a lot of the art form for people who can work together and learn from each other in those live live drawing sessions it used to be you'd have to do some stuff send it off to somebody wait for them to dial into the board, download it, make their changes, and upload it back. And now you can do it together. If you want, in Pablo Draw, you can just sketch out something and then you can fix it. So there could be four stages where there's like a rough outline and then you like fix the outline and then you add color and then you add shape. My name is Jeff Corcoran. I go by the pseudonym Blackjack. I think every ASCII artist has a set of characters that they use when they draw. I know I certainly have a style. If you see an ASCII that uses a lot of the characters that I use, you might be able to guess that I drew that that piece. And what that means is that if I'm drawing, you know, um, a face or say a straight edge with a slight curve, there are certain characters that I will use to create certain gradients. And I know that if I use these characters in this order, uh, for this length, it'll create that kind of a line. So it, it's it's very intuitive. It's not even something I think about. Even years and years after drawing ASCII, I, I haven't drawn regularly in over a decade. I still, when I sit down at an editor, I'm still able to, to just draw like it was yesterday. I'm able to visualize the characters and then my, my, my hands just type the characters as they go. So I think finding out what characters make certain curves, um, and, and, and what characters can, can shade and can shape a piece is important. And I think that for every artist, it's gonna be unique to what you what appeals to you, what you like typing. It's in your head, you, can, you know how tall each character is, you know the type of negative space each character represents, and you're able to, to, to think, okay, I wanna create a curve that's this shape, and I, I have in my mind maybe uh, 15 different characters I'll use to create a curve, depending on the grade of that curve, depending on maybe you want it to be a bit lighter, maybe you want to leave some negative space. I I'd say that with ASCII art, uh, a lot of it is, is certainly just revolves around negative space more than just coloring and shading because with ASCII background colors, they don't look very good. So color with ASCII is a lot trickier because you're probably only going to use foreground colors and the actual character's negative space impacts the art, I would say, a lot more. I'm going to show you something I'm actually working on right now. 
This thing right here, where my cursor is, this is going to be some guy's face. I have this habit of things being way too small scale. So, like, a face is much easier to draw if it's this big than if it's this big. So I, like, started working on this, and then I'm like, oh, God, this sucks. Oh, you know what? This archway is going to be easy to do. Let's do this archway for a while. So that's personally, believe it or not, a big part of my process is, like, alternating between hard stuff and easy stuff. Um, you know? But again, that's that, that's literally just what I do. I don't know what other artists do. So yeah, I mean, How do you make the choice of which character to use, even? Oh, dude, you have characters you like, and you get used to them, and you know what they do. I mean, it's also, it's very experimental. So the thing about the modern tools that's so crazy is you can undo and redo stuff. So, like, I don't even know, because I've never fully, like, I've never gotten to the maximum of the undo potential. But you can work on a piece for an hour, undo everything, and then do it differently if you wanted to you know, and then redo it and see, you know, you can like cut and paste, like you can sort of do cool tricks because of the medium. Okay, so like, look at these guys. Like, this is a strange choice, you know, and by the, I mean, this is a strange choice for how to like deal with someone's face, but that's kind of what I was feeling at the moment. Um, that's a little bit of a thing I would say I'm known for is using weird characters like these. Those are like smiley faces right there. That's a call. You don't, yeah, I mean, certainly I think if most people were trying to depict this woman, they wouldn't use these. But, and you know, I may, I also, I will experiment with it more. Like the fi finished product may look different. That's what I have there at the moment, you know. Um, some of this stuff, it's weird. You'll like go down this hole where you just try 27 different things and then one of them's off. How long would it typically take you to make a, a a fairly simple say 80 by 25 you're asking the right guy alistair because i figured this out um so in in i do want to be clear in my experience i am slower than most artists so i think other people would be faster than me but so if you think about like 80 by 25 is a total of 2000 blocks in general I can do about 500 blocks, like an ANSI of five, a 500 blocks of ANSI fully done takes about an hour. So an 80 by 25 should take me, it's a little bit less than this. It would take me a little bit less than four hours to do. Um, and obviously if I rush, I could do, you know, faster than that. What inspires you to create your artwork? I really like translating stuff to that format like i will look at a picture and be like what would this look like as an ANSI?" i really like that and in fact it can be a problem because sometimes what happens is that question gets answered early on in the process and then i lose motivation to finish the piece i never know how the piece is going to turn out i have pieces where i'm like oh that was so much cooler in my mind than what it ended up as and then i have other pieces where i'm like this is way cooler than I even thought it was going to be, you know? It's definitely more fun than some of the other shit I'm doing. You know, if I have a bunch of annoying work to do, like, ANSI would be, is a good 20. You, one thing that's nice about ANSI is you can do it for, like, any amount of time. You want to spend 10 minutes drawing ANSI, you can spend 10 minutes. You want to spend two hours, you can spend two hours. So that's the thing I like about it. Collaboration. Um... So uh, I guess there's two kinds of collaboration. There may be more, but um, for me, in my, my mind at the moment, two types of collaboration uh, for what Blocktronics does. One being the fact that you've got a bunch of wonderful people in your group all making art. They're not all wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a bunch of creative people then with creative differences, perhaps, working collaboratively to some extent yeah. on the graphics. Yeah. I would agree. <laughs> but then there's also collaboration with um, third parties or, or individuals fully in the most case. Um, and these art packs that you have, um, I mean, again, going, you know, for example, that um, that one, the acid trip, um, just to refer to something I know as a staple Blocktronics piece, um, you had 
a massive amount of collaboration on that, both Blocktronics members and also, um, like you say, you had Radman there as well. What, what's the sort of biggest collaborative um, effort on a, on a score or an art pack or whatever? I think the biggest one was we had a pack called um, WTF4 and we did a massive joint. It was this massive collaboration uh, from memory. It was about just say 25 artists from, it would have been maybe 10 countries. I think that's what I read. 25 to 10 countries or 24 to 10 countries. We all collaborated on one piece. Um, it was this long scroller of just, it, it even made um, news on some websites at the time as well. Um, I think it was the equivalent of, if you printed it out, it would be as long as a seven story building. <laughs> it was massive, it was crazy. Everyone just jumped on board. Um, I think we were using Pablo Draw at the time, which is, a, a, is just some drawing software for, for Anzi. Um, and you can start servers on them and then you know multiple people can join and then you can just draw in real time. Um, and so I think at one stage we would, we, we'd have this server on that was like a 24 hour server and you'd have, you know, 10 guys on at the same time, just drawing away and then they would leave and then a couple more would jump on and keep drawing. And it was this insane piece of just, I, you know, I couldn't even explain what was on. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure Adolf Hitler was on there writing a, or was that the acid trip one? That was acid trip. That was acid trip, okay. <laughs> um, maybe this, no, hang on, wait, WTF4 was the one with the zombie, zombie Ronald McDonald, I think was on there. I think I drew on, on the zombie Ronald McDonald. Um, you know, and it just went on forever. Um, how long? I'm not sure how long it took, um, but I'm pretty confident that we were very, um, very surprised in the amount of time that it took to release. Only because everyone was so into the piece at the time that um, nothing lagged. We were just on it 24 seven and something was constantly getting done. But if I had to put a number of hours on it, um, let's just say it took the span of a, a month um off and on and it was done That's it, amazing. Was, it was well, it, it was probably yeah it's probably one of the, the best collaborations that we've ever done i think we've tried to do something like that again but we just haven't had the push to do it i think you've got to be in the right, right moment at the right time to, to be able to do something like that and that that time hasn't happened again uh, mm -hmm. lately, unfortunately. And nobody was getting paid for it, right? No, mm -hmm. not at all. I mean, we should. <laughs> well, you absolutely should, right? Uh, look, sometimes sometimes you're able to charge um, for ANSI. Um, I did one for some software company not that long ago, and um, yeah, they paid me, I think it was maybe 250 US dollars. I mean, it, I would have done it for free, but give me some money and uh, happy days. <laughs> yeah. A benefit, isn't it? Getting paid for doing the things oh. that you love. Yeah, and not everyone can do it. So why not be able to charge for something that's, you know, I suppose it's a niche market, isn't it? But you know what? I think if, you know, someone wants ANSI art for their BBS, I would, I would genuinely feel terrible trying to charge money to get you know, to give them art. I just, I don't know. I, I think that, that BBSs have, have played a big role in ANSI for, for a very long time that I think, you know, every now and then you should be able to pay it back and, and, and just, just, just do something for free. Well, I almost feel that um, BBSs and ANSI are, you know, it, if you look back on it, you know, you could almost say, and I, I could confidently say that, BBSs were, you know, well, they're obviously the first form of sort of one of the first forms of, of modern digital communication. And, and, and ANSI art was, I think it was your first form of almost internet advertising. We would advertise BBSs. Um, I mean, nowadays we're completely outdated, you know, with, with what we do. But, um, you know, I think it was the start of, of what you've got now as the internet. 
I, I think that was honestly the, the start of it all. It's just that the funny thing is a lot of people just don't know about it. The internet came and that's all people thought it was. They don't know the history, uh, well, they don't know the history prior. They just know that they can uh, go onto Google and, and, you know, search away and, and that's it. I started dialing BBSs in 1992 when I was 11 years old. I got into BBSing pretty early. I was pretty young. Uh, and for the first few years, I just kind of stumbled through bulletin boards until I started programming. At a, at a pretty young age, the age of 14. And I was programming BBS mods at the time. And of course, if you've ever programmed a bulletin board mod, you know you need art for that mod. And I would reach out to these artists that I saw on this pedestal, these, these incredibly talented ANSI artists and, and ASCII artists. And I just got tired of waiting for them. So what I ended up doing was I ended up trying to draw my own art. Um, and fast forward, <laughs> 10 years of drawing and and running a group forever. And uh, I would consider myself an ASCII artist uh, for life. I started drawing in 1996 uh, when I was 15 years old. And I quickly joined local groups that were local to my Baltimore, uh, to my local area in Toronto. Uh, and then soon after that, I uh, the internet came around. And once the internet really popped off, everybody jumped on IRC and that's when the local BBS scene kind of merged with other BBS scenes from all over the world and I got to meet some of my heroes in various groups like Acid at ICE and eventually I myself joined ICE, uh, Acid's uh, ASCII division Remorse uh, and I started an ASCII group called Mimic ASCII. Uh, Mimic ASCII ran from 1998 until 2008 and we had 87 packs most of those consecutively every single month during an era which you could consider the decline of ASCII and ANSI art. So the difference between ASCII and ANSI art, um, it seems obvious, right? There's ASCII is potentially a more limited character set. It seems like, uh, you know, you're just using characters you can type on your keyboard. But, uh, and, and ASCII has been around longer. Right? You, you see those, those graphics of typewriter ASCIIs. But modern ASCII uses uh, basically the same character set as ANSI. Modern ASCII from the 90s onwards uses the high ASCII character set. The only difference really is things like shading and colors. Uh, it's, it's a lot more difficult with ASCII art to get the same effects with shading. You're not using blocks, you're just using, you know, um, usually characters that have a lot more um, kind of white space or, or negative space in them. And so, but really the differences between ASCII and ANSI aren't that different. Uh, and, and the way that, that artists operate isn't that different. We're using the same editors, the same pack structures, the same methods of distribution. Uh, the difference really is all in the characters. And so for shading ASCII, for example, you're not using shading blocks. You could use the letter L instead of a dollar sign, or you could use the letter I or a semicolon or a period. Pretty much any character, every character has a different amount of negative space in it. And you just eyeball the, those characters and how well they represent shading in a piece of art. Each artist's style is different. Each artist uses different characters. And I think that's that's a really interesting thing about ASCII is that you're not really just using blocks, you're using all these different characters. And so some some ASCII artists, the ASCII artist Konami and Mimic, he used smiley faces for most of his art, which was which was very unique. Whereas a lot of people drawing what you would consider new school ASCII use dollar signs. Uh, new school ASCII versus old school ASCII is another thing in the ASCII scene. New school ASCII is considered more like ANSI, right? It's using characters to create more photorealistic images or more full images, whereas old school ASCII is more reminiscent of graffiti, or it's more the outlines of characters. Uh, another thing with ASCII is that ASCII uses different fonts. There's the Amiga font with ASCII. There's the IBM PC font with ASCII. Different fonts allowed you to use the different characters to create different styles. Uh, and I would say that ASCII is more of a different style than ANSI, rather than ASCII being a different medium than ANSI. Like I said, they're using the same characters, but ANSI was was different enough where ASCII artists didn't really feel the same rivalry, rivalry with ANSI. We felt like we were part of the same scene in a lot of ways, uh, just, just different styles of art, different types of shading and curving and different characters, but ultimately we everybody just loving text mode art and drawing the same kind of thing. Even though we were in two separate groups, two, and in a lot of cases, 
different art groups released only ANSI, some art groups released only ASCII, some art groups like ACID had an ASCII division, which which was separate still, but affiliated with their, their kind of parent ANSI group. I, I never drew ANSI myself, but I certainly knew a lot of artists that did. And I'd say that the general consensus for the BBS era of ANSI was that it kind of reached its peak in the mid nineties, you know, maybe 95 or 96. Whereas ASCII art was a different style of text mode art that didn't really start, I don't think it reached its peak until the late 90s, uh, maybe even early 2000s. And so with that late 90s uh, kind of emergence brought the internet. So ANSI is on decline, ASCII is growing as the internet is growing. And what that brings is things like wares, terminal art, Amiga, uh, Telnet BBSs from all over the world and most importantly, artists from all over the world. Mimic had artists from over 30 countries in the world um, distributing work, their work through FTP, IRC, and email. It wasn't just uploading through a bulletin board anymore. You had the, you know, you had wares groups reaching out to ASCII artists, asking them to draw for very real, very active scenes that distributed you know, uh, programs and games to thousands and thousands of people. So you, you had a different audience with the Wares scene. So every Wares release comes with uh, what they call an NFO file. And the NFO file has all the release information. It talks about the person who maybe cracked the game, the person uh, who created, um, th who distributed the game, uh, and the group that was associated with the release of the game. And all that information would be inside of a big ASCII. So you'd have an ASCII with like, typically probably a skull or something. And then inside the skull, you had all this information about the, the wares group and about all the people involved with it. And it was just like having great art for a bulletin board, having a well-designed wares NFO is the same thing. It's, it's you're showing off your group's ability to, to have a great style. So ASCII has a lot more practical application than I'd say uh, ANSI does, right? There's 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 the wares aspect, but there's also terminal art. And terminal art can be as simple as you load up a Linux shell. And the first things you see is a NeoFetch ASCII that displays your system information. Uh, you also see ASCII, I've seen ASCII art in programs. When a, when a program starts up on the command line, it shows a little ASCII. There's also tools that show different words through ASCII fonts on the, on the command line. So I think even if you're not um, in really aware of the ANSI or ASCII scene, you're probably aware of ASCII art, even if that art might not be as complex or as like photorealistic as say, you know, a really well-designed ANSI or ASCII. I know with the I know with with Blocktronics, you know we've a lot of the time we have um, for the most part we have uh, a lot of people that used to be in groups like Acid or Ice or or whatever like some other obscure group, um, and they would just want to sort of you know um, rekindle that that you know that flame uh for nostalgia's sake and you know they might be in their you know late 30s early 40s and they might have some extra time up their sleeve now and they come back and and they join us which is great but um you know very rarely we will have um a younger person join who wasn't a part of of anything in the mid 90s to the late 90s to the you know early noughties they were they had no part of it but they wanted to learn how to draw ANSI like you guys are in it for a completely different reason that we are I find that interesting um yes. you know our uh, ideally mine was for BBS's I, I was logging on to BBS's in you know I think 1994 you know with a with a 14.4k modem um kids these days don't know what that is so I find it remarkable when artists come along and they want to learn it now. And, you know, they're, they're significantly younger than, than, than us. Just like the emergence of the ASCII scene being in line with the internet growing, uh, what that leads to is better communication and collaboration tools. When I first started drawing ASCII, you know, I was drawing offline alone using the draw and then uploading a single file somewhere. 
Now there are programs that allow you to collaborate in real time with artists anywhere in the world. Uh, there are, I've heard about uh, people just leaving open their editors and having group collaborations that last weeks or months with people coming in to contribute. So I think that having global communication tools, you know, the ability to just chat with somebody, uh, no matter where they are, really just broadens the reach of text mode art in a way that that could never happen with bulletin boards. And that includes with, with the bulletin boards themselves, because anybody can host a Telnet BBS now, and it, it works the exact same way. You can access it from anywhere. You don't have to worry about purchasing multiple phone lines that you can have more than one person connect at the same time. You can just host your bulletin board probably from home internet, and, and that's probably good enough. Um, Amir, um, 15, I'm known as odd in the art scene. Yeah, I joined like a year, yeah, a year ago in November last year. And ever since I've just started drawing, I guess. Which art scene are you a member of? Most of the time I'm with Mr. Gris, but I I am um, I like I also released a bit with Legacy Crew and I made some art for the new pack they're going to release soon. Excellent. All right, so you're yeah. 15 years of age. So um, when I first got into bulletin boards and uh, you know ANSI graphics as well, although I can't draw, um, when I first got into it, I was 14 or 15 years old myself, and um, it seemed really cool and exciting and and all of those things at the time, there was nothing else like it, I guess. Um, how did you manage to find your way into something, I guess, which is a little bit antiquated, right? ANSI graphics is is not something that people really see in the public anymore. You know, you don't go onto the internet, you don't see ANSI graphics. So how did you get to find out about ANSI? Well, I've been interested in digital art for a while. And on some nostalgic trip, I checked some files I made and remembered that I used to like draw a bit with a, a program called RexPaint. And then I started digging into what graphic it use, what graphics it uses. And so then I found out it uses ANSI. Started digging into that, and then I found the subreddit found the Arachnet uh, Discord link, joined that, and then I found the Legacy Crew one, and from there I just sort of started join. First piece was trash, to <laughs> say the least. Well, isn't that always the way, right? You start off, uh, yeah. and then you get iteratively better. So would you consider yourself, you know, obviously 15 years old, you're pretty young, but would you consider yourself an artistic person? How, how did you... You know, how did you first start drawing, painting? How, how did you get into art? Uh, I I first got into art like I started drawing. My sister my sister draws too. Uh, I just got really more connected to digital art, and from there I started experimenting. Pixel art was really awesome. I really liked it, but. Uh, seeing how you needed to do everything in such a large scale, I got deterred. Yeah. Then ANSI came along, and whilst it is not like easier, it does have some similarities to pixel art, and I could pick it up sort of quickly. And like, whilst it is, you do need to like do large scale stuff from time to time. Usually you get you can get enough details in small pe like small uh, pieces of art. Then like you don't need to invest. So I don't really get scared or like anxious for making a a like a piece. I just open uh, Mobius and there's a canvas and it's a pretty good size and yeah. I think that there's people who have uh, natural artistic ability out there. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I would call myself. Uh, I don't think my hand-eye coordination is that great. It took me a long time to be able to 
visualize uh, while typing characters to create things like curves or shading. That's what took me the longest. The idea of, you know, on paper, you can sketch something. Uh, and these days, there are a lot of editors that let you draw outlines. And I'd say that that's probably the best way to go. If you're getting into to art, think of it like just a, a tool like you would draw on, on paper, right? Create an outline first, make sure your proportions are right, and then fill fill everything in with the characters you want to use, be it anti or ASCII. There's one artist in, in particular in our group who um, I'm thinking of who started drawing, you know, when Blocktronics came back around 2013, when we did our Awaken pack, he came around 2015, maybe. Again, doing it for completely different reasons. And you can see it in his artwork, like the way that he approaches Anzi, you can see that he hasn't got these, um, these things holding him back, like some of us do, where we know that, you know, you've got to shade it a certain way, or you've got to, you know, you've got to color it a certain way because that's how you used to do it. These newer guys that come in, they have no history, you know, of these basics. They come in with like completely different ideas, and sometimes they'll even use ice colors, which is is frowned upon. Uh, you know, it's frowned upon depending on who you speak to. Um, I, I mean, I absolutely love it, but but some people don't like it at all. Some purists. What's an ice color? It's when you use. Um, oh God! So. Two, you know, you've got your, your bright colors and you've got your dark colors. Um, you know, obviously you can't, there are certain, there are two colors that you can't mix together because when you spray them in DOS, they flash, they blink. Um, nowadays, well, you can, you can morph the two together. You can use the two, the ice colors. So a bright blue and a dark, uh, a bright blue and a bright pink. And you can use those two colors together and they won't flash and they'll create a completely different color completely different shade um, and it makes the ANSI look like something else it's something that we didn't do whereas there are, there are newer people out there doing it now and it makes the older people look at how they do their ANSIs and, and they might do them differently as well um, and are those compatible with the old DOS code page 437 ANSI no no it's not yeah. compatible yeah. it's only comp if you want to just display it online it's compatible you know if you want to put it up on like 16 colors or if you want to save it as a, a jpeg or, or whatever then it, it won't blink but you know your standard dos no it won't work it'll just blink and you won't be able to make out what it is that has been drawn so i think that's why a lot of the purists are very uh, anti ice colors, but I'm pretty pro ice colors. I just don't do it enough because I think from a young age drawing ANSI, I've been conditioned to do it a certain way. And then everything outside that normal feels unnatural. And do you think that this is something you're going to carry on? You're going to keep going on with for years? Or do you think this is something you're going to, you know, start with now and then as you grow, um, to do more art, you might go into, you know, um, like you said, block art or, or, or other, uh, other more refined forms of art, or do you think that you'll do this in tandem? I think that I'll continue to draw ANSI. I may like experiment with other forms of like text mode art uh, eventually, but I'm, I'm gonna keep drawing ANSI. It's, it's nice. And obviously you've had involvement now with some of the ANSI art community. Uh, do you find that they're a good bunch of people? They're friendly to get along with? Yeah. I've talked with uh, Pinguino and I've like I've been to the two camp. That was great. Like I was in the Zoom call. Of course, I didn't really use a camera, but I was there. It was fun chatting and join with them. They hosted a server and I think it was on the 16C uh, Mobius server. So I joined them and said join. Also had a collab with Pinguino, which was really fun. Uh, had some collabs with uh, Cat X and some other artists. You said that you'd been on BBSs when you were like a kid, 14, 15. And you obviously started doing ANSI around that sort of time.
Yeah, about, I think about 16, I think I started drawing hands here. So what is it? Obviously you liked it then, you thought it was cool, but you still really like it now, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. What yeah. specifically is it about ANSI that that makes you, why, why do you love it so much? I like the community. I like the small tight community that we have. Um, I like the fact that it's, it's not a very well-known art form. It almost feels, you know, in the equivalent of, of, if I could compare it to anything, it almost feels like it's some kind of punk scene. Also, you know, I like trying to push a medium that's already very restricted. It's it's the art form itself. I, I just love it. Uh, you know, you can, I mean, I could pick up, a, you know, Procreate on my iPad and, and draw something that is, you know, technically a hundred thousand times more detailed than an ANSI. But to put the amount of time and effort into an ANSI that looks nowhere near as detailed, it's actually a lot harder to do. Um, and that's a challenge in itself as well. Um, I also like, I, I like the fact that we can collaborate with other artists um, and be able to tell, you know, the difference between everyone's style. Everyone is quite individual in the anti-art scene. Like there's, uh, there's not one artist that draws like the next. It's everyone's got their own thing and it's quite evident there. Um, and in a small world, um, well, in the small anti scene, it's, um, I, I, I like that. It's quite refreshing. Is there anything that you wanted to put out, uh, that you think would be of value to the, um, the viewers that you think, um, you would encourage people to get into the ANSI art scene? Well, if you like, if ANSI art interests you, then check out the 16C website, 16 colors. Uh, in there, if you're planning on getting into it, I suggest looking at the tutorial tag first before like starting anything to get a grasp uh, on what's like how to draw because I like first started on it and I didn't know anything about the tutorial tag for a bit so I just drew without like any guides or any guidelines. I created 16 Colors around 2004. 16 Colors is an ANSI and ASCII art gallery. Um, back when art groups first started, they packaged zip files up of artwork, uploaded them to BBSs and spread them across the country, across the globe, slowly. What art packs were, were really a zip file of ANSI graphics or ASCII graphics. It created kind of an underground scene of art groups. And as the web started to grow and mature, probably around 99, um, I had just a page that rendered the packs that were released in that single month because there was a time when dozens of packs were released in a single month. So I just had the latest month. Um, and then as Hosting got a little cheaper, storage got a little cheaper, and we got further from the start. I I put together 16 colors with the help of a DVD that Radman of Acid Productions put out called the Dark Domain DVD was kind of the start. It was a collection of most of the packs up to that point, although there's still a lot that were missing at the time and are still missing now. But I started 16 colors to encompass everything ideally the vision was always to have almost a wikipedia of of the ANSI art scene and it went through different iterations over time around 2018 um burps of blocktronics noticed that it was having some downtime and actually he runs the current iteration of 16 colors so that is his his project now and what you see now is much closer to the vision I had. It's very well indexed. It's very well cataloged. You can go back to 
1992, 1994, all the way to today and see see what's out there. It's far and away from what, what we saw in 1994. I wanted people to see how the art form had progressed from its early days of 25 lines and, and relatively simple graphics. It's a really good way to, to experience the art scene without having to have been there or known the artist or be deep into it. But the idea was I wanted it to be around. I wanted the art not to disappear. You know, digital art is is very different from all the art forms before it because it's it's easily lost. You know, you can't store it in the attic and bring it out later. That's why I also had the the GitHub repository of all the packs so that if anybody else wants to do a similar project or a different project using the same content, it's there. I started with just being able to view this stuff more easily. That's what that's what I started with the pre-16 colors version. It was so you don't have to download the packs, get a viewer, get get an editor so that you can render them because it was as hard in 1999 as it is now really to, to view them. We had already gone into a world of Windows that didn't display DOS well. If, uh, if you were talking to the audience here, if you're talking to perhaps even the youth of today, what could you tell them that they might be interested or spurned on to get into ANSI? Uh, okay. If you're considering ANSI right now, run. Don't do it. I've wasted a lot of years. No, no, no. no. Look. <laughs> you keep me in suspense there. <laughs> it's, uh, look, I've wasted a lot of years doing ANSI art, but I've made a lot of friendships along the way. Um, I've been able to be very creative through it while not being paid for it. Um, that's a good motivating factor for doing it. So if you've ever thought you might want to try your hand at making some computer art, you know, it doesn't just stop at memes, it doesn't just stop at TikToks. Uh, you open up your, your pixel art editor or your free ANSI art editor, or hell, you can draw ASCII art in Notepad if you have to um, and see what happens. It can be a lot of fun. At least a couple of the programs that I've written over the years, as as uh, in when they start up in the shell, I've had ASCII's display. Uh, so there still is a practical use if you're not just thrilled on the idea of making art. I know some people are very, uh, you know, you you create something out of necessity, and not just for the love of art. If you're not naturally artistically inclined, maybe the idea of being able to make a little logo for a program you're writing, if you're a software developer, maybe that's appealing. But what I'll say about text mode art is that the tools have never been better, and I would say the community has never been better. Uh, people are older now, they're a little bit wiser, a little bit more mature. I'd say everybody's very tolerant now, um, and it seems like everyone is really interested in just helping each other. And and not only that, but, but helping grow the actual mediums as a whole. I'd say that ASCII and ANSI art has never looked better and has never been more technically amazing. I got contacted by Alpha King, who is another contemporary anti artist. He was like coming to, I live in New Orleans. He was coming to New Orleans a few years ago. And he's like, hey, do you want to meet up? And this is a guy, I mean, we've had maybe three minutes of conversation in chat rooms. Like that's about the extent to which we know each other at this point. And we meet at this hotel bar and we're like drinking and talking for like five hours. And it felt like someone who I had always been friends with. And it's just because like, we're both passionate about ANSI and BBSs and all that shit. What's cool about it is this is the type of community where you are either incredibly passionate about it or you're probably like not involved. It's like, and when you get like, you know, we've had these modern get togethers. We've had, we've had like a few get togethers and they're just really amazing. It's really, really amazing because it's all people who love this stuff. And when you're around people who love a thing that you love, there's not really anything else like it. And if you haven't, like, I would say, like, if you have not had that experience as a human being, you are missing out. That's what I would say.
And that's probably, that is probably one of the best things about being back in the scene is like just the opportunity to actually spend time with people who love this thing that I also love. What else is there? Well, you're not alone. We'll help you out. You can join us. Um, we'll indoctrinate you and we'll screw your life up. Now, look, it's again, look, uh, uh, look to be serious, it, it, it's fun. You'll enjoy it. If your brain is wired to, to something that is slightly underground, something slightly obscure and a little bit different, um, and you're very arty, get into it. I don't regret a minute of, of um, any of my time in ANSI. It, it's been well worth it, even though I've made no money from it. It has been very rewarding, and, and Locktronics has given me, um, you know, the opportunity to meet um, and speak with a lot of like-minded people. Um, people that some people that I've never met before, but um, you know, I feel close to them than people that I know in the real world. Um, and I think that is very rare, very special.